Now we move to taking the plea, and uh, I have two questions in this regard to Mr. Bougon. First one, Mr. Bougon, can you please confirm that you have explained to Mr. Taganda his right to plead either guilty or not guilty to the charges? Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je confirme que j'ai eu l'occasion d'expliquer personnellement à Bosco Taganda qu'il pouvait plaider coupable ou non coupable à toutes les accusations. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you. And my second question, uh, Mr. Bougo, I can ask a client to plead guilty or not guilty to each of 18 counts he is charged with, one by one, but if the position of your client is the same to each count, then he could be asked for his plea on all counts together, rather than to conduct the, I would call it, fastidious exercise of reading them out separately and asking him 18 times. So there are two alternatives. What, which of them do you, do you prefer? Merci, M. le Président. La position de M. Bosco Taganda est la même pour les 18 chefs d'accusation. Je propose, M. le Président, que la question lui soit posée en bloc pour tous les chefs en une seule question. Merci, M. le Président. Thank you very much. So then, Mr. Bosco Taganda, please rise. Mr. Bosco Taganda, I'm asking you, do you plead guilty or not guilty to each of the, those 18 counts you are charged with? Thank you very much, Mr. Taganda. You may sit down. All right. It means that we will now turn to the opening statements. The Chamber recalls that in its decision on the conduct of proceedings, it decided that the prosecution would start, followed by the legal representatives for victims, and finally by the defense. Before we start with the prosecution, I would like to clarify that any materials that will be shown today and tomorrow, such as videos, photos, or maps, are shown purely for the purposes of the opening statements and are not at this time entered into the case record or considered to be evident. So, prosecution, you may now make your opening statements. Madam Prosecutor, you have the floor. Sorry, I see uh, Mr. Bougon. Mr. Bougon, you have the floor. Monsieur le Président, je suis désolé d'intervenir à cette, uh, ce moment. Uh, de ce côté de la Chambre, nous avons des problèmes avec le transcript qui uh, se déroule par bloc. Je ne sais pas s'il y a moyen de vérifier la technique. Je ne sais pas si les autres personnes à la salle d'audience ont la même difficulté, mais uh, afin de profiter pleinement du, de la déclaration liminaire du procureur, nous aimerions faire une vérification technique, s'il vous plaît. Thank you for informing us. First, I would like to ask the left side of the courtroom, do you have the same problems? Apparently we do, Your Honor, yes. Okay, give me a minute. I will ask court officer whether we, what we can do with that.
So I was informed that hopefully the problem will be solved soon, so please be patient, and I guess that in, in a few minutes we will continue, but in a few minutes we will hopefully uh, avoid these troubles. So now again... Merci, Monsieur le Président. So now, now again, uh, Madame Prosecutor, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, your honors, by February 2003, after months of intense ethnic fighting between the Lendu and the Hema, the armed group known as the Union des Patriotes Congolais, who, or the UPC, controlled much of the territory of Ituri in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. As a result of the UPC's targeted attacks against them, the Lendu population fled their homes to the surrounding forest. The UPC invited them to meet and talk about peace. Prosecution witness P106, a Lendu civilian, was apprehensive about the meeting, about meeting the UPC. But still, he made his way to the meeting point, joining up with other Lendu locals on the way. They went unarmed. It was a trap. Arriving near the top of the hill for the meeting, this witness saw UPC militia forcing Lendu people into a building and tying people together with rope. UPC soldiers surrounded the witness and others, violently beating them with sticks. The witness sprinted down the hill as the UPC militia shot after him. A man fleeing next to him was shot and collapsed. The witness survived. Searching for his family in the following days, he learned that the UPC had kidnapped his wife and four children. When he heard that bodies of Lendu men, women and children lay in a banana field in the village of Kobu, he made his way there on foot directly. In Kobu, he saw a banana field where the trees had been cut. Amongst these trees were many bodies. Like him, other people had come to look for their family members. He searched through the dead bodies for a long time before discovering his dead son, a toddler, disemboweled and his throat slit. He knew his wife had to be close. He soon found her. She had the same wounds. He then found his infant daughter, just seven months old. Her head was punctured and her throat was slit. Finally, he saw the bodies of his two remaining children. They had suffered the same fate. He collected the lifeless bodies of his family. He brought them home and buried them in a field by his house. Another witness, P805, a farmer, also saw the bodies in the banana field. He had never seen a mass killing before. The first thing that caught his attention was how the victims had been killed. Their heads had been beaten with a piece of wood and their throats slit. He counted the bodies of 49 Lendu men, women, and children. They had cut the bellies of four or five of the women. They had slaughtered the children. There was blood everywhere. This trial, Mr. President, is about Boscontaganda's responsibility for the murder of P106 family and those in the banana field in Kobu, and for the sev other 17 brutal crimes for which he is charged. Boscontaganda was the highest commander in charge of operations and organization. He planned and led operations, 
He coordinated logistics, weapons, and training for the UPC troops who carried out the crimes. He gave orders to attack and kill. Bosco Tanganda did not punish anybody for these crimes. Instead, he praised the commander on the ground at the time of the killings, Salumu Mulenda, calling him a real man. This trial is about Bosco Tanganda's responsibility for the murder and attempted murder, persecution, forcible transfer, rape, sexual slavery, destruction of property, pillage, attacks against civilians and against protected objects committed against Lendu, Ngiti, and other non-Hema civilians in and around Mongwalu in December and November 2002, and in and around Kobu in February 2003, and for the recruitment, use, rape, and sexual slavery of children who were under 15 years of age. This case is about the violence that decimated Ituri, leaving hundreds of civilians dead, thousands living in the forest with nothing, and a population devastated by sexual violence. My office received reports that Boscom Taganda continued to terrorize Eastern Congo for a decade more through the UPC and other armed forces. This court ordered his arrest in 2006, which he evaded until his surrender in 2013. Humanity demands justice for such crimes. Justice for the people of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Justice for the innocent lives lost, ravaged, and destroyed. It is justice that must hold Bosco Taganda accountable for his acts. Here, in this courtroom, the evidence will show that Bosco Taganda is guilty of the crimes as charged. Bosco Taganda was a notorious and powerful military leader with high command in the UPC. He, along with other senior leaders, seized control of Ituri in mid-2002 to 2003. Ituri has been described as one of the bloodiest corners of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It is an area known for its abundant gold, diamonds, and oil, a place where its people should have been living their lives with their families and benefiting from the riches of their homeland. Instead, it became a place where its people were targeted, terrorized, and abused. At least 5,000 civilians reportedly died in direct ethnic violence in Ituri in the seven months between July 2002 and March of 2003 alone. Bosco Taganda and his armed group not only terrorized the civilian population, they terrorized their own troops. They recruited and used hundreds of children under the age of 15 to wage their bloody war. They forced these children to kill and treated them cruelly. They also raped and sexually enslaved the girls. Rape and sexual enslavement of its own soldiers was so prevalent in the UPC that these girls were referred to as guduria. This is a Swahili word for a large communal cooking pot. Reduced to objects which soldiers and commanders could pass around and use for sex whenever they pleased. He and other UPC leaders, including Thomas Lubanga, and Floribert Kisembo, united in a plan to control Ituri, and they systematically expanded their power in the region. By controlling Ituri, they would not only have significant military and political reach, they would also gain enormous economic power. Power meant to, the benefit, to benefit the Hema community. Money meant to benefit Bosco Taganda personally. The Lendu, Ngiti, and non Iturian civilian population who occupied desirable land stood in the way of this plan. Bosco Taganda and those who joined him 
sought to drive out the population to gain control of the territory, and he ensured that they could not and did not return. Your Honours, the evidence will prove, beyond a reasonable doubt, that the crimes for which Boscontaganda is charged occurred within the context of a non-international armed conflict that ravaged Ituri for more than one year. The evidence will also show that the crimes occurred during a widespread or systematic attack against a civilian population covering a large territory and harming a large number of civilians. The crimes were not random, isolated, or spontaneous. They were part of a carefully planned, coordinated, and executed campaign of violence, deliberately targeting the Lendu and Ngiti civilian populations and other non-Hema ethnic groups. Boskun Taganda personally committed crimes. He also made an essential contribution to a common plan to assume military and political control of Ituri and drive out their enemies. As one of the highest military commanders in the UPC, he planned, he coordinated, and commanded the two attacks of the November 2002 and February 2003 with Floribert Kisembo and other top UPC military leaders, militia leaders. He recruited, trained, and organized the army. He procured and distributed weapons and ammunition. He ensured compliance with orders. He developed the group's communication ability. He issued orders to attack, pillage, rape, persecute, and kill or induce the commission of crimes. He and the other co-perpetrators acted in a common purpose to commit the crimes. Not only did Boskuntaganda directly or jointly commit crimes, he also failed to prevent or punish the crimes committed by the troops under his effective command and control. He was deputy chief of staff in charge of cooperation, operations and organizations. And he also exercised extensive de facto powers. His orders were executed automatically. The evidence will show that he knew or should have known that his troops were committing or were about to commit crimes. These were the same troops that had committed crimes in other attacks and using the same brutal tactics. Mr. President, your honors, you will hear from many witnesses during the course of this trial. Some of these witnesses have reported alleged attempts to interfere with them to end their cooperation with the prosecution. We have taken and continue to take measures to address this. Let me caution those individuals behind alleged attempts to intimidate ICC witnesses. These are serious offenses under the national law of states parties. These are serious offenses under the Rome Statute of this court. This trial must proceed without interference with either the prosecution or the defense witnesses. Lastly, Mr. President, you will hear repeatedly throughout the trial about the ethnic conflict that pitted the hammer against the Lendu, Ngiti, and other ethnic groups. You will hear evidence that the UPC was a Hema militia created by and for the Hema population of Ituri. It is important to acknowledge here that both sides to the conflict, the Hema and the Lendu, as well as the other ethnic groups, perpetrated acts and suffered as victims during the conflict. Atrocities were committed by all sides, and the militias in the area exploited ethnic divides to satisfy their greed. Let me be clear. This trial is not a trial of the Hema people. It is not about vindicating or indicting an ethnic group. Indeed, my office has equally prosecuted crimes committed against 
de Hema Victims. Je tiens à préciser encore une fois que le procès qui est sur le point de s'ouvrir n'est pas le procès de l'une ou l'autre communauté. Il ne s'agit pas du procès d'une appartenance ethnique ou d'un groupe ethnique. Il s'agit du procès d'un individu, Boscon Taganda, qui a profité des tensions ethniques en Ituri à des fins personnelles pour accéder au pouvoir et à la richesse et qui, pour ce faire, a commis des atrocités. This trial is about his individual criminal responsibility for murder and attempted murder, pillaging, attacks against civilians, attacks against protected objects, destruction of property, rape and sexual slavery, persecution, forcible transfer of a civilian population, and significantly, the enlistment and conscription and the use of children under the age of 15 and their rape and sexual slavery. This case, Mr. President, is about the thousands of victims of his crimes who must finally have justice. They deserve no less. The evidence will prove that Boscon Taganda is guilty of the crimes as charged. Mr. President, your honors, my learned colleague, Nicole Sampson, the senior trial lawyer of the case, will now present the context in which the crimes were committed in a more detailed outline of the evidence supporting the charges. I thank you, Mr. President, your honors. Thank you, Ms. Bensuda. And one comment to Ms. Simpson. Ms. Simpson, please take into account that we should break around uh, 11 o'clock, so please arrange your speech accordingly. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. President, Your Honours, I will now present a more in-depth explanation of the prosecution's case and how we intend to prove it. Bosco Ntaganda is charged with 18 counts of war crimes and crimes against humanity committed in 2002 and 2003 in Ituri. Thirteen of these charges, as you can see on your screens, relate to violence committed during two separate but related attacks. The first, in and around Mongwalu and four neighboring villages in the Banyali Kilo collectivity in November and December 2002. And the second, in and around Lipri, Bamboo, Kobu, and 23 neighboring villages in the Walendu Jatsi collectivity in February 2003. Five of the charges relate to the enlistment and conscription of children under the age of 15 into the armed wing of the UPC. Their use to participate actively in hostilities and their rape and sexual slavery 
between 6 August 2003 and the end uh, 2002 and the end of December 2003. The crimes charged occurred in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in the province of Ituri. Ituri lies in the northeast of the DRC, bordering Uganda. Rwanda is southeast of Ituri. The capital of Ituri is Bunya. Ituri is divided into five territories, Mombasa, Irumu, Jugu, Mahagi, and Aru. Each of the five territories is further subdivided into collectivities. To give your honors a sense of the size of Ituri, it's over 65,000 square kilometers. That's roughly the size of the Netherlands and Belgium put together. As you can see on your screens, the two main attacks at the center of this case took place in the, Jugu, uh, in the Jugu territory. The charges related to children in the UPC are not restricted to a set area. These crimes occurred throughout Ituri and throughout the period of the charges. In 2002 and 2003, Ituri had up to five and a half million residents from 18 ethnic groups. Amongst the largest ethnic groups were the Lendu and the Lendu South, known as Ngiti. The Hema, divided into Hema South and Hema North. The Hema North, also known as Gigere. The Alur and the Bira. The Lendu, Ngiti, Hema and Bira communities resided principally in the Irumu and Jugu territories. The Alur resided mainly in Mahagi. These statistics are largely the same today. You will hear that ethnic groups considered not to be indigenous to Ituri were known as non originaires or Jajambo such as the Nande ethnic group. The two charged attacks occurred within a series of attacks launched by the UPC between August 2002 and May 2003. The attacks also occurred in the context of a non-international armed conflict that spanned more than one year and was marked by periods of intensity. On your screen is a map that will plot some of the main UPC attacks in this period. Witnesses and documents will describe the UPC assaults against Bunya and Songolo in August 2002, Zumbe in October 2002, Mombasa, Komanda, and Erengeti starting in October 2002, Mongwalu, and surrounding areas in November 2002, Lipri, Bamboo, Kobu, and surrounding areas in February 2003, and Bunya in March and again in May 2003. There were also Lendu Ngiti militia offensives in Ituri that show the protracted nature of the armed conflict. Despite the ceasefire agreements in March and May 2003, by December 2003, there was still no peaceful settlement. The fact that Monuk was given a Chapter 7 mandate by UN Security Council on 28 July 2003 authorizing it to use all necessary means
to fulfill its mandate in the Aturi district is itself evidence of the ongoing nature of this conflict after June 2003. This Manuk mandate was extended again on 1 October 2004, and authorization was given by the Security Council to increase personnel by 5,900 because the situation in Ituri continued to constitute a threat to international peace and security in the region. In the relevant period, various organized armed groups participated in the conflict in Ituri and had the ability to carry out protracted armed violence. These groups included the UPC, viewed as a HEMA militia. The UPC, as you can see on your screens, stands for Union des Patriotes Congolais. Its armed wing was called the FPLC, or Force Patriotique pour la Libération du Congo. I will refer to both the UPC and the FPLC interchangeably during my presentation. <clears throat> 